has set this night aside for the changing of your life. And if you'll open your heart to God, he can touch you tonight in such a way that you'll never be the same. And you may be in here right now looking good on the outside, but a slave to all kinds of sin on the inside. You can leave here free tonight. You may be a believer hungry for a breakthrough and you've been seeking God to break through for years, that breakthrough can come tonight. God's here. You've come a ways to be here. How many that are here tonight do not live in the immediate area? Would you raise your hands? Look around. That's just about everybody. You've come here for a reason. Wednesday night services are led by the School of Ministry, but you have the advantage of being here two weeks before classes have started, which means there's room for you. That means you can get all the ministry and prayer that you want, but don't be a spectator. Every night God moves differently in the revival. If you're waiting to figure it out one night, it's gonna be different tomorrow night. When you figure it out tomorrow night, it'll be different Friday night. So if you believe that God's here, I encourage you dive in. And if you're not sure what you believe, we had the service Saturday night, a young man came up to me and he said, Steve had preached an urgent message, and this young man came up to me and said, I am a homosexual, just like that. I said, you want to be free? He said, I don't know. He said, I don't, I said, you believe the Bible? He said, I don't know if I believe what you believe. Of course, the good question is, why are you coming into a church, coming up at prayer time, telling someone in distressed tones that you're a homosexual? I brought him over to Steve. We loved on him. Steve prayed for him. Listen, friend, whatever your situation is, if you're here, you might as well enter in. Amen? So, Father, do whatever you want to do tonight in our midst. Be exalted in our midst. This is your night tonight, Jesus. Your will be done, Lord. Our school is committed to going to every nation with the good news of Jesus. We just had a team come back from Ivory Coast. Are they here? A couple? Well, we have a song from you for you from Ivory Coast, and this is called I Have a Very Big God O. Are you guys ready? All right, this is a song I learned over there, and the words are I have a very big God O. He's always by my side. A very big God O. By my side. By my side. Are you ready? This is like intercession. It does something in the spirit. Are you ready? I have a very big God, oh, he's always by my side. A very big God, oh, by my side, by my side. I have a very big God, oh, he's always by my side. A very big God, oh, by my side. I can hear you, I have a very big God, oh, he's always by my side. A very big God, oh, by my side, by my side. I have a very big God, oh. He's always by my side, a very big God, oh, by my side, by my side. I have a very big God, oh, come on, don't call me. by my side, a very big God, oh, by my side, by my side. I have a very big God, oh, he's always by my side, a very big God, oh. Now we're going to shout, God is big. God is big all over me. And God.
Someone tell it back to me. God's love is so big, it's so big, it's so big. God's love is so big, it's so big, it's so big. God's love is so big, it's so big, it's so big. God's love is so big, it's so big, it's so big. But man's love is so small, it's so small, it's so small. It's so small, it's so small, it's so small. Man's love is so small, it's so easy, easy, small. Man's love is so small, it's so easy, easy, small. But God's love is so big, it's so big.
Lord, you said that we should be holy because you are holy. God, we want to be like you. When we're in your presence, God, we don't want to drive you away or grieve you, God. We want to be a blessing to your heart, oh God. We want to be holy. If that's what you say you want, then we want it too, God. We want it. Whatever you say, God, we say yes. Take my heart, transform it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, take my will, conform it to yours, to yours.
so that we may live like we're saved. Thank you, Jesus. We would live a life worthy of the name Christian.
Everything you do is wonderful. Everything you do is lovely. You're so beautiful, God. I'm in love with you, Jesus. There is no mountain back. And he touched 
I want to ask everyone before we change the order of the service, I want to ask everyone to do something consciously right now. Consciously open your heart to the influence of the Spirit of God. Whatever that means, whatever God requires of us, whatever an encounter with the Holy God produces, whatever calling that means, whatever repentance that means, whatever miracle that means in our lives. I want to encourage every one of you, open your heart right now to the influence of the Holy Spirit. Musicians, you can just keep playing. Father, we're asking you tonight with our hearts wide open to speak to us and to change us and to do whatever you want to do in our midst, Lord. God, we put down the walls, we put down the resistance, we drop everything, Lord, that we're hanging on to, and we lay ourselves on your altar, asking you for fire, Lord. Jesus. Lord, we say it again, this is your night given over to you. Have your way. Jesus. Everyone that's able to stand, let's stand and sing this chorus of proclamation that the temple is filled, the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. Let it be tonight, Lord, that when each of us leave, our temple is filled with your glory.
just lift your hands. You don't have to shout out, but just tell them, Lord, you're worthy. Let's worship our God. You're worthy. You can shout if you want. You don't have to. You're worthy. You're holy. You are the God of all. You are the God of all. Creator. Sustainer. your hands to him one more time. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I wonder if it's quiet around the throne of God right now, if there's any praise. I wonder if there's any thanksgiving, adoration going on in heaven around the throne of God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Let me ask you something with everyone here standing. How many of you in the building tonight are 25 years old or younger? Huh, look at that. How many of you are 75 years old or older? Well, hang, hang on, hang on. Come on up here, Milt. This is some man plugging away. And uh, Now, we, 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 hope, we hope to pass him one of these days because you were, you were our oldest student last semester, and it's, we need people in the, we need some folks in the 80s and 90s. But uh, just talk to these young people for a minute. Tell them, tell them, give them a little push. Tell them what they need to do with their lives. Well, we'll say the same thing we said last year. Go for it. <laughs> but I'm, I'm so happy to see so many of our, of our students back, Dr. Brown. The one thing I've been praying for, for the first, since the first time I came here a year ago, purity, obedience, humility, boldness, but bold humility. Mm. Yeah. And, and I see that, the reason I'm back here is because of you guys. You know, I don't need a, an associate degree. I have a master's degree. So associate degrees, I can add anything, okay? <laughs> But I need what you guys are giving us. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I mean it. I've been, I've been going out with, with Brian there. We got the prison ministry started, and Brian's leading it again. I guess again, the next couple of semesters, you got more plans for us. But uh, Steve Walker has made me one of his assistants up there. So this semester's going to be a little rough. I got full time, and I'm going to be going up there at least twice a month. And that's three and a half hours away, you know. But he's made me an assistant, give me the, the authority to go throughout the prison anywhere I want, any place I want. Really? When I go in there, the first thing I go is go into solitary confinement. And this last week, three men in solitary confinement confessed Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
I better give this back to you. I'll start preaching. That's all right. Bless the Lord. For everyone young that was feeling tired, shame on you. <laughs> Praise God. Well, what, well, before you sit down, how many that are here with us, this is your first week visiting Revival. Would you raise your hands? Everybody here for the first week in the balcony? Well, great. God bless you. Why don't you sit down? We're excited about what God's doing on the streets in evangelism with what God's doing in the prisons. I'm amazed to hear the reports as the folks come back from prison ministry, amazing things happening. It's time that we stand up and act, amen? It, it's enough to be reading all the headlines about what demonized people do. It's about time to be reading about what the people of God do. Amen? We're glad that you're here. Uh, right now, there are probably about 700 people across the street, members of Brownsville Assembly of God, having a, a family night service over there with special meetings for their children and so on. That's going on Wednesday night at the same time that the School of Ministry holds the revival service here. And uh, next week is registration, and our orientation is Monday, August 23rd. If you were planning on coming this semester, had most of your paperwork in, had solid recommendations, and thought, well, I'm just a little bit too late. You're not too late if you get everything in. There's still the possibility of getting in this semester. In fact, uh, I remember, I guess it was our third semester. We started January of 97 with 120, and then we went a little over 500 uh, in, in our next semester, in our second semester, in the fall of 97. And then in January of 1998, we, we finished registration week and we were just ready to start classes and it, it's not good to start once classes start. We end up picking up a lot of people last minute, but it's best to be there from day one. But I remember getting up and telling the student body that we had a slight predicament. I said, either pray that God will add somebody or take somebody away because right now we have 666 students. <laughs> just not the best number for Bible school, although uh, last year, Scott and I were in, were in England, and uh, they, they, the hotel where, where we were staying, we, we each had rooms in the hotel. Somehow they must have thought that I was spiritual enough to overcome it, because they put me in room 666 in this particular place. But no, nothing got on me or touched me or affected me. But anyhow, I, I was joking with the students. I said, pray that we add one or lose one, because we got 666 right now. Anyway, before the week was over, we had something like 706. I remember we picked up 40 more people over that week. So it, it's not too late to be enrolling. Uh, you can enroll in January, and, and, and we start a fresh cycle there. Uh, but but uh, be in prayer, be in faith with us. We have students already that have graduated that are working in different parts of the world. In fact, in a moment, you're going to get to hear a testimony from the team that just got back from Australia. Where are you guys? Where's the Australia team at? Some of you? Some? All right, it, it's been a long boat ride back for them, so they're still getting over boat lag. No, just kidding. We've got some of them here with us. And in a uh, moment, we're going to give you an opportunity to, to uh, help us uh, with the expense of the ministry of the school. I just want to make a few quick announcements to you. Services, of course, every night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning. God will be moving. The Word will be preached every single night. There will be an opportunity to, to get right with God, to receive prayer, to worship the Lord. And then we have day sessions, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday also. So take advantage of everything that's here. Get out for everything you can. If you're a minister or a Christian worker and you want to find out about the four-pronged approach of the church here to impact the community and to extend the vision of revival, you can be here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning with Pastor Carrie Robertson, the associate pastor of the church here, and he'll explain to you the, the approach of the church and answer questions that you may have. And then 1130, Lila Terhoun, who heads up our intercessory prayer ministry right here in the sanctuary, will be doing an open session on prayer and intercession for the public. So that's tomorrow. And then I'll be doing day sessions also Friday and Saturday. We'll, we'll tell you more about that uh, tomorrow night and Friday night. But we're glad you're here. God's in our midst and he's going to change you. Before the service is over, we're going to pray for everyone that wants prayer, whether you're sick, 
whether you need to be filled with the Spirit, whether you just want a fresh touch from God, whether you're bound and want freedom, our faculty here is going to lay hands on everyone that wants prayer. And like I mentioned, Wednesday nights right now, before the bulk of the student body gets back here, there's room, so take advantage of it. Tomorrow night it's going to be more crowded, Friday night, Saturday night will probably be an overflow some of the nights, so take advantage of the fact that there's actually floor space, that you don't have to be a, a ballet dancer to step over bodies, okay? Uh, get prayed for it, let God touch you and change you, amen? Uh, I'm going to invite Dr. Josh Peters who is our associate director of our missions department and heads up our sending organization with the school. He's just gotten back with his wife, Toby, from Australia, from an outback country, way out there, wilderness, etc. And I'm glad they found their way back to Brownsville, so they just want to share some of what God's done. Is that all right? All right, come on, guys. Yeah, I hear you. Well, he didn't call out my number, so I didn't have to stand up. <laughs> before, before the team comes, I want to uh, share a couple of things with you, and then I want to show you a six-minute video. We'll show you what we did in two weeks in six minutes, if we can do that. Okay? But uh, about a year and a half ago, a man came from the Northern Teller Territories in Australia. And the power of God hit that man uh, somewhere on this floor, and he went back so changed, so on fire. I mean, he loved God anyway, but he was just, just had a heart for the aboriginal people anyway. And he, he just was set on fire. And as he went back, he, he took uh, uh, as many of the Brownsville videos that he could get with him, you know, a few. And he took them back, and he began to copy them and send them out among the aboriginal communities there. Now, if you've, you know, I, I've been traveling and, and ministering in missions for about 15 years, and I don't think I've ever been to a place that I saw more hopelessness than in the outback of Australia. And it just, it just broke my heart to, to see these people because they're, they are set in a system that all they do is they do nothing. I mean, they have no life, you know, as we would understand life. They, they, they get up, they sleep as long as they want. They get drunk every night, every day. They, they just, they have no life. They walk out into the wilderness, walk out into this desert. It's an amazing place for the hand of God to move. Okay, so every, everything we share tonight, we give God the glory because without Him, we couldn't do a thing. But I'm telling you this, we were singing about the angels rejoicing and, and all these uh, what's going on in heaven? Well, there's a lot of rejoicing going on over the Northern Territory of Australia tonight because th <clears throat> there are born-again people there now that were not before. Yeah. There are some healed people there who were not healed before. There's some demonized people who are no longer demon-possessed anymore. Oh, it's good. But this man took these videos back and he shared them in this one community and the children began to watch these videos and as they sat and they watched and they watched over I mean they have nothing to do they don't they don't make their kids go to school they should school is there but it's minimal they watch these videos and the power of god hit them and they're laying in the floor in the floor laying on the ground shaking under the power of god and they talked to this man john who brought the videos and they said what is this? He said, it's just God. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the fire of God on these kids. And they said, well, we want to know about this. So he began to write to school. Please send the team. Please send the team. And somehow word got, you know, back to me, and we pray over every request, and somehow the Lord said, go. So we were among a lot of firsts in some of these places. There's a, very, there's a lot of racial tension there between the blacks and the whites, the aboriginals and, you know, the black fella and the white fella, as they say. And we, being the white fellas, had an invitation to go into a place where they don't invite people like us. And at the end of the program, at the end of the two weeks, we asked them, said, could I send a team back? Could I send more people back to minister here in this part of the world? And they said, no. 
but you can bring that same mob that you brought over back. Now, we're the mob. I mean, you know, in Australia, we're the mob. We're the Pensacola mob. That's a good term, you know, not an unruly bunch. In fact, they had a great team, by the way, Dr. Brown. It was a great team. They functioned well. But we had many, many powerful things happen. But I want to show you first uh, about six minutes. The Lord's getting ready to warm the machine up. So I'll tell you a story while he's warming the machine up. Yes, yeah, story. These guys have their own stories now. Do they have their own stories to tell? All right. You may be seated. Well, you ready for the word of the Lord tonight? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Come on, Holy Ghost. <laughs> I believe God wants to set his people free. We hear of yet another shooting recently. And, uh, seems like the devil's really starting to come out of the closet. It's about time that God's people come out of the closet. <laughs> It'd be good if they start marching out of the prayer closet, but most of us, or many of us, are not in the prayer closet. We're in other closets. We're in closets of bondage and darkness. But I believe God's love is upon us. And I believe His mercy and our Redeemer are strong. And I believe that God wants to set His people free. Paul said it was for freedom that Christ has set you free. It was for freedom that Christ has set you free. See, he did the work in the past. Isn't that right, Bob? That's what you try to teach your students. He did the work. And when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the release from sin and the bondage to death and the devil is done. It's over. The master was serious when he said, it's finished. And we embrace that by faith. Normal people become supernatural people when they embrace that reality by faith. But they don't always understand. They don't understand the principles. They don't understand how to apply it. They don't take it very seriously. Their faith only goes so far. And they don't realize that it was for freedom that you've been set free. So stand firm and stop being subject to a yoke of slavery. I'm reminded of when God spoke to Moses and he said, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into Pharaoh and I want you to say, let my people go. So Moses did. And Pharaoh said, who's the Lord <laughs> that I should obey his voice? I don't know the Lord. And besides, I won't let you go. I believe that applies to some of us, maybe even many of us in this room. We are God's people, and we have heard messages about freedom. We have read verses about freedom. We will accept the fact that in the past, on the basis of Christ's cross, we have been set free, but we're still subject to some yoke of slavery. We keep talking to Pharaoh, let me go, and Pharaoh says, I won't let you go. You will not go out and worship and serve your God in righteousness and holiness without fear. But I believe tonight that there's going to be a Holy Ghost blast from heaven to glorify Jesus and to apply the work of his blood. I believe tonight that God is going to apply the freedom. I believe that God is going to set some of us free. What do you think about that? See, we can't do what only God can do. And some of us spend our time doing things only God can do. We try to remove bondage by ourselves. We try to work ourselves up. We try to go to this person and that person. We go to Elijah. We call on Elijah, but we don't call on the God of Elijah. Elisha was not looking for Elijah. When Elijah took off, Elisha said, where's Yahweh, the God of Elijah? See, we try to put, invest too much in the flesh. We try to invest too much in other people or even in ourselves or self-help methods or whatever it is. We invest ourselves in these things, but we, can, we cannot do what only God can do. Let's let God do what he wants to do tonight. Amen? Let's open our hearts to the power and the reality of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus. Let's stop listening to the whispers of the devil, to the doubts of our flesh, and let's just get real with God, and maybe God will come and do what only he can do. On the other hand, there are certain things that only we can do. God requires certain things of us, certain principles to put into motion, 
certain action to take. We can't earn salvation by our good works, but we must take action and respond to what God has done. And I believe God wants to speak to us along these lines tonight. I believe God wants people who are strong and who are free. What else, are we, what else do we have to do this battle with? God's trying to raise up an army. God wants to fill us with fire. God wants us to be free. God wants us to be at rest from our enemies. God wants us to be out of the bondage of sin, that we might stop causing others to blaspheme his name all day long. How would you like to be free? How would you like to walk in the freedom of the sons and the daughters of God? How would you like the Holy Ghost to come on you tonight? How would you like Jesus to be more real to you tonight? Why don't you stand with me and let's pray just one more time. Let's just stand together and pray. Let's do it. Hallelujah. Father, we really mean business. This is not a show, Lord. These are real people. This is a gathering that's been designed from eternity. This is the only moment we have, Lord. We lay our lives before you. We call on your name. We pray that the great Holy Spirit will come into our midst. We pray that the word of the Lord will come. And we know that it shall not return to you void, even as the rain that you send to the earth. Meet your people tonight, Father. Do what only you can do. And as the psalmist prayed, teach us your ways that we might walk in them, that we might walk in liberty. Teach us these things tonight, Lord. Visit us in power. Lord, for the one who is without hope, bring the hope, bring evidence, bring confirmation. For the one who is sick, bring healing. For the one who is lost, not even sure that they will go to heaven, bring salvation, the knowledge of Jesus. Lord, for those who are still bowing to the counsel of the wicked one, set them free. Tonight, it stops in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And while you remain standing, if you have your Bibles, why don't you get them and turn to Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll just begin to read there. Ephesians chapter 6, a familiar passage. By the way, my name is Bob. I'm a teacher at the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry. Still trying to get easier tests. Not going to work. And uh, the students might be familiar with some of the comments I'll make on this passage. I also will share some of these things in churches because I believe that it is a message, one of the messages that God's trying to impress on the hearts of his people. And I'm trusting that God is going to speak clearly with a polished arrow to your heart tonight. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. My people perish for lack of knowledge. We need to get with it and put on the armor of God. Jesus died that we might strap on the same clothing God himself wears. They're the glories of God. And you, no matter who you are, no matter how smart you think you are, how stupid you think you are, no matter how young or how old, you can wear the same clothing of Almighty God and walk this earth with victory and with freedom and with rest and with joy. How else shall we be witnesses unless we are filled with this power? But there are certain things we just refuse to do. We just refuse to stop bowing to the demon gods of this age. We refuse to let go of the world and cling to God. But God is mercifully calling us back tonight and saying, put your armor on. Absorb yourself in the things of God and watch what I can do through you. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, of course, assuming five and a half chapters of, of writing there, it behooves us to concentrate on what God is saying in full context and be familiar with his word. Finally, be strong in the Lord. After I've told you about the victory of Jesus Christ, after I've told you about your place in him, 
after I've explained to you how to apply these things, how to live in your homes, how to live in your church, how to treat one another, now that you understand what it means to be filled with the Spirit, listen, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God that you might be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. I'm telling you, the devil does not want you to hear this. The devil does not want you to catch this. The devil's going to try to pluck it out of you right now, try to get you distracted. Some of you are going to start leaving for no reason. You don't need to leave unless you have to leave. Unless you absolutely have to leave. You've got something that's an emergency or an urgency, personal or family or something about the kids. We understand that. But if you don't have to leave, let your soil just absorb this word. Just sit and concentrate for a few minutes here. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our wrestling match is not against blood and flesh, but against the princes, against the authorities, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. My Bible says that Jesus loves righteousness and hates lawlessness. And there are subtle and not so subtle powers that are out there that are trying to create wickedness in your life. How does the devil get in? He gets in by sin. The very things that open the door to the devil, these are sins. God says, shut them. These spirits want wickedness. They want to manifest wickedness in our lives. There are evil forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Amen. You may be seated. Well Paul begins by saying be strong in the Lord. Christians can I tell you something tonight? Those of you who may just be wondering about all this and you wouldn't even call yourself a Christian, you're maybe still exploring or you are uh, counting the cost still, and there is a price to pay, by the way. We make no bones about that. Please listen as well. Can I tell you something? Be strong. You know how you be strong? Sometimes you just... Be strong. <laughs> There's not always a trick to it. You know, sometimes part of this is just get up and do what you're told to do. Sheer obedience sometimes is applied to our attitudes. Be strong. Well, there's seven ways that you can be strong. Well, I can tell you five, but I'm not going to tell you five because we don't have time. I'm going to tell you two. But the first one is this. Be strong. Sometimes that's all you got to do when you're starting to whimper and whine and cower under the little inconveniences of Satan and the temptation of the wicked one. Oh, I'm so weak when that person calls. It's just so easy for me to go out. Why don't you just let this word speak to your heart? Be strong, for goodness sake. Just be strong. Stand up for what you know is right. Just do it. If, if that's not enough, tell yourself in that moment, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. There's been many times where simply recollecting in my mind this word and charging myself with it, it makes all the difference in the world. Sometimes you've got to talk to yourself a little bit. You've got to perk yourself up with the word of God. What, what, what do you have on your mind? What do you have in your mouth? Put the word of God in it. The psalmist would speak to himself. He'd say, soul, why are you cast down within me? I will hope in God. Bless the Lord, my soul, and all that is within me. 
He's talking to himself. Sometimes that's what I do in the morning when I'm feeling down, I'm feeling bad. Sometimes I'm physically down. I start talking to my body. I said, you get back in line. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to put up with this in Jesus. I used to not do that. I used to get sick more. I'm working on it. Be strong in the Lord. It's exactly what God told Joshua before he was going to take charge of the nation Israel and they were going to go to war. And that's all God said. He said, be strong, be of good courage, do not be dismayed. I am with you wherever you go. Meditate on this law day and night. I'm reminded of the time that in the story of Joshua chapter 10 when Israel was called on to help the Gibeonites. They made a covenant with them, so they had to help them when they were in trouble. And sure enough, Gibeon got in trouble and the five kings of the Amorites came against them. And so Joshua said, well, friends, we have to go help our covenant partners. So they marched all night long and surprised the Gibeonites. And God had told Joshua before then, he said, I've given them into your hand. <laughs> so off they went. They surprised them. And that's the story when Joshua prayed that the sun would stay still. He actually spoke to the sun. It stayed still. Hadn't happened before or since. God gave them a mighty victory. And the five kings of the Amorites went and hid in this cave. Joshua heard that they were in the cave. They said, well, Joshua said, roll a stone on that cave. Trap them. And then he gathered Israel to the mouth of the cave. And he rolled the stone away. He said, get those five kings. And he called chiefs of Israel out. And he said, put their necks under your feet. And so here are these five kings of the Amorites under the feet of of the chiefs of a bunch of nomad warrior wannabes. Here they were, five kings of the land being taken over by the second generation of ex-slaves. The first generation was where they were slaves. The second generation were children wanderers in the desert. A few skirmishes, but nothing major like this, nothing this bold. But through their God, they shall do valiantly. And what they saw with their eyes was not what God saw in the spirit. And Joshua knew this. So here these five kings are under the feet of the chiefs of Israel. And you can see Joshua going back and forth before the armies, just like I am before you. And he says, look! Look at these kings. Look at these enemies under your feet. Look at it. Because in the same way the Lord will do to all of those who rise up against you. Be strong and do not be dismayed. For the Lord will do this to all of your enemies. Friends, remember the works of the Lord and be strong. Nothing needs to rob you of your inner strength. Nothing needs to steal away from you a simple attitude, I am not going to lose again. My God will arrive. Amen? You know how else you be strong? That was what you call a smattering. (laughs) Bring it home, Holy Ghost. The Bible says in Psalm 105, seek the Lord and his strength. You know what one of the major problems of the Church of America is? We do not have inner strength. We do not care for our hearts. We do not do the things that God requires of us to strengthen the inner life. Paul prayed, if you, if you look closely, not only the way Paul prayed, the way he taught, even the way Jesus taught. Jesus taught at length on how to strengthen the inner life. To give in secret, to pray in secret, to fast in secret. He taught at length in this, starting in Matthew chapter 6. Paul prayed for the Colossians that you would be strengthened in the inner man by the Spirit. In Ephesians 1, that the eyes of your heart would be open so that you would understand the hope, the wealth, and the power that is yours. So that you won't be so easily shaken. What do you, what do, you do first thing in the morning? I'll tell you what I do. I crawl out of my bed, and I crawl into my closet, and I start crying out to God for help. 
for strength. It's the only way to win this battle. We need the strength of the Lord. We need to be strong in the Lord. And the way that is done is by seeking the Lord and his strength. There is no substitute. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. Does this characterize you? Do you wonder why you keep going back to the same sins, to the same habits, to the same problems, when all you try to do is get your shot here and there with the Lord by yourself or at church? It's not enough. God is not as interested in building your body as he is in building your spirit. Seek the Lord and his strength. Learn how to pray and cry out to him and to trust him. I can remember one time, years ago, I was a Christian, and I was going through this, this season where I, I kept getting frustrated and losing my temper with my wife. And I was really upset about this. I was frustrated. I went down into my prayer closet in the basement of our house where, we, where I prayed, and my office was there. And I can remember crying out, God, what, why does this keep happening? Before I even have time to think about it, I can't get it back. What's going on? The Lord spoke back to me and said, you're watching TV too much. I thought, TV, what's that got to do with my anger? He said, that's what you're meditating on. That's the better part of your inner life. I thought, God, what a slacker. I got no heart. I got no heart. So as time went by, finally, it's gone. I'm not soaking my brain constantly on worldliness, church. The basics are the key to life. Where are you putting your heart? God says, watch over your heart with all diligence. From it flows the springs of life. Have you ever read in Leviticus all those kosher diet laws of the clean and the unclean? You ever wonder what the point of all that is? For Jesus to come and say, ah, forget it. You can eat whatever you want. <laughs> why, why did he make them go through all that? Because what you digest in your body becomes a part of you. Amen? And God cared on that level what went inside his people. But when Jesus came and declared all physical food clean, he then said, it's not what goes in the body that defiles a man, it's what comes out of his heart. So then in turn, what is it about the heart that we need to look at kosher law about? There are some things we take in that are clean, and there are some things that we take in that are unclean. There's a lot out there, and some of it's good, and much of it is not good. And if you are eating unclean food in your heart, that's the junk that's going to come out. And you wonder why the devil is always harassing you? It's because you invite him into your living room every day. <laughs> It's because you invite him on your lap when you're taking the bus to work. And what's open before you? What are you putting in your heart? Is it pork? <laughs> or is it lamb? <laughs> There's a reason why those things are back there in the Old Testament. Because more vivid of what goes in your body becomes a part of you, what goes in your heart becomes a part of you. And it's out of your heart that comes adultery, fornication, and murder. What are you eating? What's your diet? Clean or unclean? Remember the man of the Gadarenes? Jesus cast all those demons out. Where did he send them? Into the pigs. Because that's what the demons were. They were pigs. And that man had been feasting on unclean food. And did he have any strength against the devil? I don't think so. There was a legion living inside of him and taking control of the whole region. Jesus cast the pork out, friends. <laughs> That's why that happened. Just in case you want You want to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might? Seek the Lord in his strength. He's prepared a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Feast on the food that's good. Why don't I follow this a minute? <laughs> why don't you turn to Revelation chapter 3?
Revelation chapter 3, please. Holy Spirit, Jesus, Father, I love you. This is your time. This is your house. These are your people. Come, bless, sanctify by your truth. Move in our hearts. There's a lot of young people here tonight. Can I tell you a secret, young people? God's after you in a unique way. God wants to raise up a generation of young prophets. When I say young prophets, I'm not talking about people to get up on a stage and start prophesying, although I'm not not talking about that. I'm talking about people who know their God and whose hearts are broken before him and who walk in holiness, even on a public school campus, even in an unclean workplace, as long as God has you there. And you speak the truth and your life backs it up. Take a generation like that that, God, that the devil has tried to destroy through abortion and through an almost unthinkable repertoire of unclean things in music and television. Show me a, prof a prophetic generation, a holy generation, a prayerful generation that can come up in the midst of that. I'll show you a work of God in the last day's revival. What do you think about that? So you listen to me and you listen good. Just because you're young don't give you no excuse to be absorbing all your video games and all your stupid magazines and all that trash on the television. One day you're going to stand before God and he's not going to hold the, your teenage years for you as an excuse for your uncleanness. God wants you. And if this is speaking to you, you need to get to this altar tonight and do not dare leave the same in Jesus' name. Revelation 3, starting in verse 14, we won't read it all, but Jesus is speaking to the church of Laodicea. Now listen to verse 15. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Isn't it interesting that God uses there, uh, the Lord of the church uses there an analogy of putting something in his mouth? And instead of swallowing it, he ejects it. You see, to put something in your mouth and taste it is not the same as swallowing it. And the life that you live before God tastes like something to him. You say, well, is that just an analogy? Is that just like a, a picture you're giving me because we eat and that's something that's more real? No, it's God tasting your life is more real than you tasting food. That's why God made you that way, to taste and be nourished so that you would understand just how intimate God is. Your life and your prayers taste like something, and they minister unto him. They soothe him, they satisfy him, or they annoy him, depending on where your heart's at. Even the sacrifices of the Old Testament said, would it be a soothing aroma before the Lord? And even at one point it says the fat and the, and the, uh, the blood was food. Not that God literally came down and ate that, but it was like that to them so that you would understand that what you are before God tastes like something to him. It is presented to him. Your Lord is at the banquet table of your life. What are you giving him? Well, he tells this church, if you're, not, if you're just lukewarm, I'll spit you out. Just because I put you in my mouth does not mean that you are affecting me. I may spit you out before you go down. And by the way, the same thing applies to you. You may get something in your mouth, but before you swallow it, you can spit it out. You ever been to a grocery store? How many times has something gotten in your mouth, but before you swallow it, you got to spit it out. You saw it. It's too late, especially summertime. You about need to go around with blinders on. Some of you young ladies, and I didn't see anybody. I'm not thinking of anything specifically, but just because it's summer, please try to stay on the modest side especially in the church. I'm talking about in the, among the people of God. Sometimes I see something, I think, oh my goodness. Uh, now that picture is in my head, and I just start to spit it out and pray in tongues and quote the scripture because I'm trying to guard my heart. I don't want that coming up later as an excuse or just a picture in my head. We try to teach our children this too. They're very young, but I, I'm thankful for uh, last Saturday, I think it was, we were at McDonald's. Not the time we invited you, Dr. Brown. It was a week later. We had to get back. And um, 
because I had the kids alone, so when I have the kids, we go to McDonald's. <laughs> and we were going to go play on the play thing out there, you know, all the jungle gym, whatever they got. And my daughter, my oldest daughter, said, Dad, I don't want to go out there and play. I said, why not? And she said, because the kids out there aren't dressed very modestly, and I don't want to be among them. She's six years old. Praise God for that. <laughs> Of course, the bad part about that is the kids weren't much older than her, the way they were dressed. <laughs> clean or unclean, cold or hot, what does it taste like to God? If you're not cold, if you're not hot, I'll spit you out of my mouth. You say in verse 17, I'm rich, I've become wealthy, I've need of nothing. You don't know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy for me gold refined by fire so that you become rich, white garments that you may clothe yourself, the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Can I point something else out to you real quick? It's interesting to me that he's concerned about their appearance and their seeing, so to speak, the ability of their eyes to see. It's like their spiritual perception is darkened. They think they're rich, but they don't even have the spiritual perception to tell that they're, they're poor and they're wretched and they're naked. They are so... They are so sickly spiritually that what is an obvious sin to somebody else, they don't even realize. They think they're fine. We don't realize how far gone we are because we're so far gone. We've been so malnourished. Our eyes are dim. Our hearts are dull. And what would have been a blatant sin a generation ago is acceptable in the church today. How do you stop that? How do you reverse it? You change your diet. You feast on clean things and your eyes will get sharper. You'll become more sensitive to the things of the Spirit, and you'll grow, and you'll be strong in the Lord. So watch, watch what I'm telling you here, based on these verses. In verse 19, the ones I love, I reprove and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He says, I'm knocking at the door. Now you hear the knocking, but he doesn't say the one who hears the knocking. He says, the one who hears my voice. See, the one knocking, many people hear the knocking, but most people only hear <laughs> because their spiritual senses are dull because they've, they've been absorbing the demonic of this life in the church. But Jesus says, if you hear my voice and you open the door, I'll come in. He says, if he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I'm happy tonight that there are many people here who are beginning to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. What we don't understand is that the Spirit has been speaking to the churches, but the churches, has not, the churches have not been hearing the voice because they've been feasting on the world. So they have not heard, have not opened the door, and God's manifest presence has been nowhere in the church, but they didn't even know it because they're so conditioned by the things of the world, it doesn't make any difference to them. That's beginning to change. Tonight, God wants to set you free. Tonight, God wants to change your diet. Tonight, God wants you to open the door and let him in. Watch how this works. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you remember when Isaiah was in, his, in that great vision in Isaiah chapter 6? And when the vision began, he heard the angels, holy, 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 but he didn't hear the Lord until his lips were purged, then he heard the voice of the Lord. It's when the unclean became clean that his senses were opened and he could finally hear the voice of God. Friend, I don't think God spoke to him for the first time then. In fact, I'm sure he didn't. 
And I don't think that the counsel of the Lord said for the first time at that point, who will go for me? I think he was saying it all along. Who'll go? Who'll go? Who'll go? But no one heard. They've been eating too much junk food. Their ears were dull. Their eyes were dim. They didn't hear the voice of God. So why don't I ever hear the voice of God? What's your diet? So why don't I quite catch what you guys are catching? What are you eating? What are you feasting on? I was telling Dr. Brown, as we were hearing the testimonies of these young people and Dr. Peters who went to Australia. And this gal was weeping and her heart was broken over these people that w would have been forgotten and they're lost and someone needs to tell them about Jesus, you know, just the normal Christian burden. And I thought five years ago, this didn't even exist. God was burning over these people for forever. But it wasn't until relatively recently that we started to hear what he was saying. Because God's awakening his church. There's good things going on around here. Good food. The kind of praise we got, the kind of preaching we get, the, the new touch of the Holy Spirit to understand things better, the new passion for Jesus, good food. It's not bad. It's good. It opens your eyes. And when your eyes get open, you go, oh, wow, didn't know that was there. I'm going to come back at some more. That's good. Now, I'll tell you what. I'm not, look, just like A.W. Tozer said, I may not have the biggest flame, but I know this. My flame is real. I know what I was doing yesterday. I know what I was doing today. I was feasting at the table of God. And he opens my eyes, and I start to get there. He opens my ears, I start to get there. Don't you want this? Don't you want to be free of all the lies? Start eating the right food. <laughs> then I heard the voice of the Lord. Who'll go? Uh, you know, the only human standing there, I guess that would be me. Why do you think that is? Because God's been saying it all along. But there finally was a man who was feasting and his eyes were getting brighter. He was feasting and his ears were getting more open. Finally something broke. He stepped into the presence of God visual. It was literal for him. For most of us it's spiritual, but that's better anyway. For now. Finally something broke. Finally somebody heard. Finally someone com was commissioned. But unfortunately... He was sent to a people who immediately would not listen because their ears were dull and their eyes were dim. But generations after that man's writing still impacts us. Amen? I want my eyes and ears open. So Jesus says in verse 20, I'm at the door. I'm knocking. But if you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and we'll dine together. Now look at the next chapter. After these things I looked and behold... A door. Jesus is about to show John exactly what he just meant. You have been feasting at my table. I'm going to open your eyes. So the door is open. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here and I'll show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. It says back in 321, he who overcomes, I'll grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. Friends, God means business. There's a reward out there if you'll see and if you'll hear. John got caught up into this. I'm not saying for you if you start getting more interested in God, you'll get a vision the next day. I'm not saying that. But I am saying whatever was real to John... In this revelation will be just as real to your heart if you'll feast on the things of God and stop feasting on the things of this world. Your eyes will be open and you will be free because you'll know the truth. Something will break inside of you and the truth will make you free. It can be real for you. It can be practical. It can be daily if you'll only feast on the things of God. What is John experiencing in these verses? I see a throne, the one on the throne. It was jasper, 
He was like Jasper. He was a sardius in appearance. There was a rainbow like an emerald. An emerald. There were other thrones, elders in white garments, crowns on their heads, four living creatures. What is he doing? He's feasting on the things of God. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. I want your heart open tonight. I want you to see and to hear what God is saying. God's people are supposed to be a supernatural people. You're righteous by faith. It's a faith walk that's righteousness. In other words, it's a supernatural walk that's righteousness. It's just not doing what's right. It's feasting on the things of God. I don't want to come to an altar every service and repent again. I want to see the throne. I want to go deeper. I want the prompting of the Spirit that's a whisper to be as real as the screaming in your ears right now. That's what I want. I want my eyes sharp. I want to take these glasses off and throw them to the ground. I want my ears open and my heart sensitive. There's only one way. Eat kosher. You'll hear his voice. Open the door. He'll come in. That's how you become strong. You seek the Lord and his strength. You feast on the things of God. Let me show you one more passage in Hebrews chapter 5. Turn, please, to Hebrews 5. God speaking to people tonight. Let him deal with you. Frank, can I tell you something? When God speaks to you about these issues and suddenly you're called on the car carpet and you realize, oh my goodness, I haven't even been listening to the Spirit. My senses are most certainly dull. I've been eating and drinking the things of the world. I've been on the television. I've been on the internet. I've been looking at this, this, this literature, magazines, books. I've been listening, constantly being programmed to my friends and spending more time with the people of the world as, as entertainment and as something social, not as a witness than I have been at church. I have not entered in. I have not participated. I have not gotten up and called on the name of God. That's not been my life. No wonder I'm in constant bondage. God's speaking to you. And whenever he points those things out, the first thing is, but I'm not so sure I want to get rid of this thing. I'm not so sure I want to let go. I'm afraid of letting go. Can I tell you something? Go for it. You will not be disappointed. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will not be ashamed. God will not let you down. Trust me, I haven't been to the other side to the extent of John has, but I've been over there enough to know I'm not going back. And my taste buds are starting to delight in the things on the other side. There's still some tug of war, but I'm getting delighted enough in the things of God where I'm starting to lose my taste for the things of this world. There's still a pull. I still got to keep my body in subjection and my flesh crucified. And I don't always win perfectly, but I'm getting better and better every day. I'm in training. You can go there with me. You can be free of the bondage of the enemy. You can feast on the things of God. All you got to do is do it. Don't be afraid. You'll be free. You'll walk on water. God will use you. Young people, you can't dream big enough for what God can do with you if you'll start now. Those of you who are here, you may not even be safe. You may not even be sure you know the Lord. Start now. I'm talking about another life. I'm talking about freedom. Freedom from your guilt over that divorce. Freedom from the things you've done with your body. Freedom, no more guilt, if you'll start feasting on the truth. If you'll start delighting in my Jesus. Look at chapter 5 here, Hebrews in the beginning of the chapter, the writer says, I want to talk about this man named Melchizedek. There's very important truth there about Jesus. And there is important truth. It's all about going deeper in the faith. But he says, in verse 11, I, concerning this Melchizedek, we have much to say, but it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. You know what's so wonderful about this revival? You know what the great thing is about the pulpit that Steve Hill stands behind Dr. Brown, Pastor Kilpatrick? They preach righteousness and holiness. 
they preach the cross. Be crucified to the world and be alive to God. Isn't that basically the gospel? That's the foundation of the church. Why do we have to preach something foundational and it comes across as something so new? We always have to keep the foundations there. I'm not saying we should have retracted at one point. Because once it's there, it's given, but it must always be present. It's the foundation. But why is it such a revelation? These pastors come back to their churches, and if you need it, I'm not mocking you. But it should not be such a revelation. Wow, righteousness! Woo! Let's preach righteousness! Oh, God really moved and I started preaching righteousness. You should have been a lot farther along than that. You guys should have been dismantling your city for the glory of God by now. You should be understanding where to go in intercession with the great high priest by now. You should be expert fishermen by now. But you've been dull. The Lord's been speaking. The Holy Spirit who will lead you into all truth, he's had a lot to say to you. But just like Jesus said to his disciples, you couldn't bear it. I got a one-year-old son. He's just learning some words. And it's interesting, the more he's able to understand, his diet also increases in his body. He's able to understand more. But I can't tell him, look, son, get the keys and go get me, some, uh, uh, go get me something at the store. He can't handle that. He's just a babe. His diet is on the lower end of the scale. But as we grow and as we begin to nourish on better food, our senses become more mature. But it's odd and awkward when a people who are at that baby stage after year, after year, after year, after year. And this writer said, I have such wonderful truths to explain to you about what God has done in Christ. But you're dull of hearing. You've come to need milk. You've progressed backwards to the milk stage and not solid food. Why is this? Did they miss some secret truth? No, they simply started loving the world more. They started to cower from moving forward in their faith. They got afraid. They just stopped feasting on the clean, and they began to drift away, and they didn't even know it. That's our state. That's why we're not free. We simply have lost our passion and our delight for the food of heaven. But I tell you tonight, God is going to bring you back. You got a skinny man up here preaching and screaming at you for a reason, because I've been eating. I'm not perfect, but I've been eating. And I'm full enough to say, come to the table tonight, friends. Come to the table and get strong. Get nourishment against the enemy. Get off the food of the world and come to the table of God. Listen. For everyone in verse 13 who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. For he's an infant. It's interesting that the issue is still righteousness. You know, we, we think we've achieved this great trophy of righteousness when we repent from the most basic sin. And if we still are dealing with those things, church, world, by all means, repent tonight. Put those things away. But friends, we've just begun the journey when we make that first hard, obvious repentance. There's a lot more depth to righteousness than just cleaning the basics of life. There's a lot of maturity. There's a lot of wisdom to learn in the heart when the Holy Spirit can prompt you and immediately you have that wisdom. You know what to do in this situation. You understand the call of God. You know the prompting of God when he tells you to go witness to that person. Righteousness means following the Spirit, not just living clean. It means following the Spirit. The Spirit may prompt you to give up pornography. Good night. Give it up. The Spirit may also prompt you to go start a mission under the authority of your church. But if you're not available, if you're not accustomed to his voice, if you've not been feasting, you'll never hear there's a lot to righteousness. There's a lot to doing what's right before God. Verse 14, solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. You know why some people call the things, I, I tend to live a, a very conservative life in a lot of ways. There's a lot of things that are acceptable even to some of my peers, e even to people in the church. They're acceptable to them. They're not acceptable to me. Even things, some of them, they're called Christian. They won't find their way in my home because I try to be very guarded. But I don't think I'm just being prude and legalistic. In fact, I know I'm not. I have discernment. And I can tell when there's something in that that's going to have a bad influence, especially if it's in the name of Jesus. To an extent, my senses have been practiced. And I'm telling you, you will begin to discern more sharply, not as some kind of legalistic Pharisee, 
But as a wise person filled with the Spirit, if you'll spend more time dedicating yourself to feasting on the things of God and not feasting on the things of this world. Would you stand with me, please? A musician, thank you very much. Thanks, brother. Just take a moment right now. We're going to have an altar call. You better believe we're going to have an altar call. And I believe God's going to set people free because he's starting to whet their appetite again. You know, some of you, you're visiting tonight. This is your first time here. And right now I'm going to tell you one of the big reasons why God brought you here. It's to whet your appetite. Millions, I think, by now. At least hundreds of thousands, we could probably say with safety. Hundreds of thousands have come to Brownsville simply to get their appetite wet again for God. And when they find him, they find they like what they're tasting. The peace, the joy, the righteousness of the Holy Ghost. The wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding, the maturity, the strength, the revelation, the fullness of joy in his presence. What's the secret? You just feast. You just go for it. You choose the things of God over the things of this world. Some of you have come simply to get your appetite wet. You need to do that at this altar tonight. Others of you, you are dangerously involved in sin. You're not even sure you're saved. Nothing stops you tonight from letting go, even if it's major. Even if you have to break off a relationship, even if you have to stop working at a certain place, even if you have to stop frequenting a place where everybody will wonder where you are and they'll come looking for you, and you know that it's going to be a brand new revolution in your life, there's nothing else out there for you. It will eventually fill you with the unclean to your destruction. There's no reason for you not to come to this altar. There are young people here. You've come to experience what's going on. You've come to sing and dance before the Lord. But God is beginning to point at things you're not just playing in. You're feasting on things that are out there in the unclean. You're not out there as a witness in those places. You're going there as entertainment and your heart's feasting on it and the junk's coming out. You'll just start spewing out words that are completely unclean, even though on Sunday, on Wednesday, you'll be worshiping God. You'll announce stuff against your parents, even in private, in your bedroom. You'll, you'll curse your parents. It's unclean. The, 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 the same spout should not bring both blessing and curse. Those things ought not to be because you're feasting on the world somewhere. God wants to take you out of that. God wants to grow you up and bring you to this table. I'm telling you, you can bring this table home with you. You can share it with your church. You can share it with your parents. You can share it with your children. It's good. It's good. You know what the secret to repentance is? Jesus. Joy the wonderful alternative, the things of God. So let me call you tonight to repentance. If you're a mature Christian, God's dealing with you, come tonight and pray. If you're lost in darkness and you know it, come tonight, the darkness ends. If you're somewhere in between and you're just frustrated, you're always mixed up, it can end tonight. This is your night. You have nothing to fear. You have everything to gain. If this message has pierced you and you know God is calling you, Come to the altar now and dedicate yourself fresh to God. Come and pray and seek his strength. Feast at his table. Come to the altar. Let God deal with you. Come on, young people. Have courage. Turn down a minute. Have courage, young people. Let your life change in a moment. If you're so radical for the world, be radical in this house. Change in a moment change in the twinkling of an eye right now. There's no reason why not. God's calling you to a new table tonight, to a new nourishment, to a new taste. There's still people that need to come. You can feel it. Something's holding them back. Brownsville students, if you're not under conviction and you know God's dealing with you, begin to pray. If you have nothing to pray, pray in the Spirit.
proud of you young people that are coming. You deal with the Lord. Let the Lord deal with you. This is your life. You will stand before God one day. Come on, guys. Good for you. You got courage. Deal with us, Lord God. Shine that light, Lord, even in my own heart. Even in my own heart, Lord, search us. At the altar, just cry out to God. Just open your heart to Him. Others, friends, you're here to change. God's looking at some of you and saying, well, you're worshiping me and outwardly it looks all right, but sports are your God. I'm not your God. Entertainment's your God. The movies are your God. I'm not your God. Material things of this world consume you. You say, God, why am I so weak? Why am I having so many problems? God said, what are you feasting on? What do you spend your time on? You might say, well, it's not pornography. It doesn't have to be pornography. If you watch television more than you pray and read the Word, your diet is deficient. You're out of the will of God. If you read the newspaper, novels, and magazines more than the Word, you're out of the will of God. Why do you think your diet's going to be deficient? So, boy, I can't get rid of the unclean thoughts. What are your eyes looking at? You're here to change. Humble yourself. Some of you, the biggest battle you're fighting with right now is pride. Thinking, well, if I, if I came at the beginning, it would have been okay, but now to come later. Who cares? If you step out, the only reaction in this place is people are happy anyway, okay? So if God is dealing with you, forget about what your friend is thinking or what your neighbor is thinking or what your spouse is thinking. Okay, you've got to make this stand before God. If you know that your life needs to change, step out. God doesn't owe you anything, and we don't owe you anything, and God may not talk to you again for years about this. So if he's dealing with you, friend, before this altar call is closed, step out. Step out. If you're not surrendered, if you're holding on to junk in this world, if you're feeding yourself with the things of this world and not the things of God, if you're backslidden from the word and prayer, humble yourself. If you're a minister of the gospel or if you just walked in off the street, recognize your need. That's what it means to humble yourself and get right with God. Get right with God. We'll give you another moment. Those at the altar, talk to him. He's on your side. He wants to change you. He wants to bless you. He wants to help you. He wants to set you free. He's not here to push you away. He's here to take you in. So you make things right with him. Whatever you got to cast off, cast it off. Wherever you need to ask forgiveness, ask it. Wherever you need to ask for a fresh touch. Some of you lost your appetite for God. He'll restore it tonight. He'll restore it tonight. He's done it for every one of us here. He'll do it for you tonight.
I just sense something in my heart. I just have the idea that there's, for some of you that are here, and you're even thinking this right now, this is, what you're asking me, preacher, is so radical. If you knew my life, if you knew what and who I was tied to, if you knew what you're saying for me to give up, I mean, you're asking me to give up everything. I'm not asking you to give up everything. Jesus is demanding you give up everything. The, the things he's demanding for you to give up that belong to this world are gonna take you down to hell anyway. It's a demand and a command of love. And the alternative, even in this life, is glorious. It's freedom. It's joy. It's power. It's purpose. It's destiny. So don't be so afraid of this unknown way. In fact, embrace it. You're thinking, it's so revolutionary. It's so deep, you just don't understand. I do understand. And even if I don't, it doesn't matter. God understands this is your life we're talking about. And God knows about your life better than you do. Take the plunge. Jesus is the way. Jesus is altogether delightful. He is awesome. He died for you. Nobody else died for you. He's risen from the dead with a brand new life to give to you, and you're going to follow him the same way, even with a new body in heaven. Take this plunge. Go for it. Pray through. If you know things that you've got to give up and you still don't see how you're going to get rid of it, look, do it. Right now, take a few more moments. Identify that thing in prayer before the Lord and ask for the strength to overcome that, and God will give it to you. Take a few more moments to pray about that right now. Charles, take us in again. Right now, pray about that thing. Just pray it right through, folks. Face God with it. He is on your side. He's not against you. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our cry. Lord, send mercy. Release your power. Your power break our chains, set us free. Let us feel your joy again. Set us free, Lord. Come here. a few moments our faculty and staff are going to come out and be praying for you the pattern that Jesus established for us in the New Testament after the word is preached taught the Holy Spirit will move in power usually that's the pattern usually that after the word that God wants to speak is spoken and people respond to it then the things are open for the spirit to move there are some things in your life some bondages you're praying about right now that God will set you free from as we pray some of you will be healed, delivered, touched, fresh anointing, all of these things. We want to minister to you and serve you that way after we pray and maybe spend more time before the Lord with some music. But I'd like everyone who is at the altar uh, to stand, please. If you cannot stand, if you're more comfortable being down there, that's fine. You can stay. Otherwise, everybody else, please stand to your feet. I'd like to lead you in a prayer for just a moment. And I just, I just can't get away from this feeling that for some of you, this is so radical, so revolutionary, so drastic. Man, why not go for it? I mean, why not, if it's for Jesus, if it's for eternal life, go for it. Listen, the evangelist of this revival, he didn't bring the revival. The Holy Spirit brought it and it belonged to years of praying, the dedication of the church, of pastor. 
Steve came from the outside, his own journey of going deeper in God, then Dr. Brown was brought. It was a combination of things all orchestrated by the Spirit. But God really used Steve mightily to release something in a moment and then to continue it in this church. But listen, there was a day when he was a complete drug addict. He was bound by sin and the devil and could very well have been on his deathbed the day he was saved. And the day he got saved, he was cut free. He was free. He was whole. He was saved. He was happy. It stuck. It was real. His mom had been praying for years. She probably would have been happy just to have her saved son maybe be an usher at the Lutheran church or something off drugs and clean. To this day, he could be an usher at the Lutheran church, just as saved, just as happy, praying, serving the people. But see, God's agenda was not just to save that man. When God saw him get saved, when God saved him in his bedroom, God was thinking in terms of this revival too. You see, when you're choosing to feast on the things of the Lord, you don't know why God's wetting your appetite. It's first and foremost just to enjoy and have Jesus. But you never know the way God wants to use you. You never know the bigger picture. It's awesome. There are great and mighty things out there for you that you don't know about yet, and God's not going to show you until he knows you're going to stick with the feast. Stay with this Jesus. Don't turn back. Don't let the opinions of your people, uh, your, your friends, your peers, of the devil whispering back in your ear, don't let these things steal this wonderful joy and blessing to know Jesus and to feast at his table. Amen? I don't care if how old you are either. I'm not just talking to the young people. You saw on this stage students from college age to over 75 years old. God has a, an established purpose for everybody. But if you're with him, that's the only way he'll take you. So I say, go for it. Would you say a prayer with me, phrase after phrase, repeating after me? We'll dedicate ourselves as a, as a whole team here, as a body, to the Lord. Just repeat this prayer after me, if you can agree with it, and say it with your whole heart. Our Father in Jesus' name, thank you for dealing with me tonight. Thank you for calling me in mercy and not condemning me. I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I give you my body. Take me, forgive my sins, wash me, make me new. I give myself to you, give yourself to me, help me, strengthen me, and whet my appetite for Jesus. In Jesus, name. in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, hallelujah. Just lift your hands to God and give him praise and thanks.